Welcome to the second practical lecture in the Introduction to Game Programming 1DB437 course and my name is Dr. Johan Hagelbeck. Uh, this time we're going to look at the slightly more complex Space Shooter project and I've started an empty project in uh, Unity as a starter. So the first thing we need to do here is download the project assets because in this project we will need some textures and uh, 3D models etc to make it a bit more fancy game. So we click at the asset store tab uh, next to the scene and game view tab and you should get a connection to the asset store. Uh, it might also be that uh, you need to create an account or login. I need a login right now. It's apparently was logged out. Uh, let's see, I remember it correctly. Good. So, in the asset store, you can download models and uh, even scripts and a lot of things that other users upload to Unity. And, and some of them cost money and some of them are free. And for this project, we're going to use a free asset bundle that is developed by uh, Unity because this project is originally one of the tutorials by Unity. So let's search for Space Shooter and we're gonna see something here. This is the free one, Space Shooter Unity Essentials. So click that one and it will look like this and uh, uh, this is the spaceship we're going to use in some asteroids. We can even have enemies, spaceships, but we're not going to have any such enemies in this project. And we also have some sound effects and other fancy stuff. And it's free of charge. So click the import button and you get a preparing package. And then you get a lot of information about everything that needs to be imported and we need to import about anything except we skip the done scenes because we want to make it on our own and done scripts because we want to make the scripts on our own but all other stuff is something we want to include so click import and the package should start importing there's quite a lot of stuff to download so if you have a slow connection it might take some time Okay, now it's ready. So we get some stuff here. Are you done? Done material and done prefabs. We should have removed that, but it doesn't matter. We can remove it now. Delete. Because we don't want it to be done. We want to make everything from our own. And we have some models. We also have some prefabs, as we discussed last week, uh, that is ported. And some textures and stuff. So let's see what we're going to make out of it. Uh, so, a number of folders. Now let's start the project by uh, making a scene and saving the scene. So, select Save Scene As and give it a name. So, we give it the name Level 1 and it's placed in, in the main folder and we don't want it to be in the main folder so we create a new folder and make it scenes. We can create it either by right clicking and select create or we can use the create menu to the left, create folder and we name it scenes and we drag the level one to the scenes. So now we have saved the scenes. It should be in the scenes folder correctly. Yes, that's correct. So, the first thing we need to do now is to change the game view because the Space Shooter project will be slightly different from the other project. It will be in 3D, but we will have a two-dimensional top-down view of the game. And we can do that by going into the build settings. The build settings is, as we discussed in the previous practical lecture, where we build and we set different options for uh, the game. 
So we add the open scene, so we get to level one scene here and select PC, Mac and Linux standalone. You can select something else if you like, but we will use that for now. And we will click the player settings button. So click that one and we get some settings for uh, the game to the right. Uh, so default is full screen. We remove that because we need we want it to be uh, an arcade style game and in old arcade style it's usually a s higher game area than it's width so we need a bit of a tilted monitor size so to say so screen width should be 900 600 and screen height 900 and we uh, disable the display resolution dialog so we don't want to see it when we run the game so, and that that's everything correct we can uh, close the build settings menu because we have already set everything correctly and now we need to change the game resolution so we see it as it looks like in game so we go to the game view and make sure that it's set to the standalone 600 times 900 as we just set in the menu and we see that we have uh, a screen that is higher than it's wide perfect so first thing we're gonna do now is to create the player object and the player object in this case is a spaceship. So select the scene view if you haven't already and we're gonna look at some models. If we go into the model here, model folder, double click and we open something and you will see that we have some models and one of the models is the vehicle player that looks like spaceship. So just click and drag and release in uh, the game object view panel and you see that a spaceship appear which is exactly what we want so we can press F key to focus on it or we can zoom in using the scroll wheel on the mouse button so now we have a player but to do as we usually do we rename it to player uh, that's our convention the player game object is called player and the transform, as you see now, looks a bit weird, so we reset it to origin. So it's positioned at 0, 0, 0 with no rotation and one in scale on all three axes. So we need to move our ship around. We also may need it to be vulnerable to collisions because we're going to make some asteroids later on which we ship should collide with. And since the ship is not static, it's something that moves, we need a dynamic collider. So, and to make a dynamic collider, we need to add a rigid body component. So we click add component, select physics and rigid body. And we see that the rigid body component shows up. And we are in space now and we don't have any ground plane under the ship. So if we play, the ship will fall down endlessly. But due to gravity, because gravity pulls things down in a real physics mod. But there's no gravity in space, at least not in, in uh, our space. So we disable the use gravity by clicking the use gravity box so now it will not fall down endlessly it will fly around in space when the ship collides with our objects we need to have a collision volume a collision volume is a three-dimensional volume that two collision volumes from two objects uh, a collision detection will check if they collide and we need some boundaries around the ship to see uh, where our 
where shell collisions happen, and those should be approximately the size of the ship. And there are several different types of colliders we can use. So if we look at the components, we can go to the component view and we can go to physics. We see a lot of colliders. We have a box collider, sphere collider, capsule collider, mesh collider, wheel collider, terrain collider. Uh, so a lot of different options. And, and uh, we had a sphere collider in the previous project and uh, we can have a capsule collider, etc. Uh, and those are quite primitive volumes. They are very fast when it comes to and very efficient when it comes to uh, collision detection. The more complex volume we have, the more CPU resources is needed for uh, collision detection. Uh, but we will use a mesh collider. A mesh is a three-dimensional model of an object and that is what we need if none of the others fit. We, of course we can set a box or a sphere around the ship but it will not match the exact shape of a ship. So we need a mesh collider. So we go into component, physics and add a mesh collider. And you see that a mesh collider will show up as component in, uh, in the right panel. And by default we use the player ship, the same mesh as we have imported the model. And, and that's a bit tricky because if we look at the mesh, uh, let's see if we can see it here, here we can see the mesh, you see that there's a lot of triangles here. It's a quite complex model. And the more complex model the more resources are needed for collision detection. So instead we can try and use a simplified model and a simplified model that looks like the ship but it's not all the details. And luckily we have a simplified model here which is called the vehicle player ship collider and it looks like this so it's a much better one. So we select the player object in the left menu locate the mesh for the mesh collider and we drag the simplified object to the mesh collider. Let's see, I think we need to do like this. Now it's correct. Now we use the player ship collider instead. So we will save some precious CPU resources. And we also need to make it convex and is trigger because is trigger collider as we discussed last time is needed if we want to write some code for handling collisions. So now we have a simplified collider so we improve performance of our game. So let's continue with making this ship a bit more fancy. So we go into the assets folder, uh, go into the prefabs, we have some prefabs already here, and go into VFX, engines, and now we have engines enemy and engines player. So we can make, add an engine to our ship. We already have some pre-made engines that we downloaded from the asset store. So click on the engines player and drag it to the player object and release it. And now you see in the scene view that uh, some sparks or something was added behind the player ship. We don't see it in the game view because we need to change the camera, but I'm gonna do that in a moment. So now we have some, oh, let's see, it wasn't correctly added. Here it was correctly, it must be added as a child to the ship otherwise it doesn't work. So now it's correct. And the engine consists of some particle systems. You will see now when you click them that we have some fire-ish going on behind. And they are in the wrong direction right now, but it will look okay when we change the view of, of a game. So don't worry about that. So let's set the camera, that's the next step, because 
we want to make it a top-down view of a game and now it it isn't really a top-down view uh, so let's go to the main camera we have a camera set and it's slightly above or slightly behind uh, minus 10 in Z and 1 in Y and no rotation so it's looking from behind the ship but we want to make it on top of the ship so we bring the camera to origin by resetting the transform now it doesn't look look very well but we need to change it a bit so we set it to 10 in Y now it should Hmm. Oh yeah, I forgot. Rotation must be set as well. We lifted it up 10 units, but it's still looking uh, from behind. We need to tilt it 90 degrees so it looks on the top. Ta-da! Now it looks correct. So we have the top-down view of our game. And since it's a top-down game, we can change the projection because we don't want any perspective in this game. So we can change it to orthographic. It will work anyway, but orthographic is slightly more effective. It doesn't require as much CPU resources. And we also change the size to 10 to make the ship a bit smaller. Otherwise the game will be really, really difficult. And we would also like the ship to be at the bottom of the screen, because that's what arcade style space shooters look like so we can change it a bit so we can move a camera forward a bit so we move it forward five units in z-axis and now the ship is at the bottom we can also use we have a skybox set here skybox means we have some graphics for the background in the game but we change it to solid color for now so it's a blue background. And we're gonna make a fancy background in a minute. So that's how it looks like right now. Uh, and we can change the color to black actually, since after all we are in outer space. So that looks good. Uh, we need some lighting in the game, of course, um, and we have some, always have the directional light as a start. But in this case we'll use three light sources. We will use a directional light, already added, we will modify it a bit. It should be the main light source and it should come in from a star on the right side of the ship, so shining from the right. We will have a fill light, smooth out shadows on the left side of objects of a sp spaceship and a rim light to light up the rear of the ship a bit. So we click the directional light and we rename it to the main light. Ta -da. And we change it a bit so the rotation 20 degrees and in X level on minus 115 15 in Y level and you will see on the game view that it's shining from the right the ship is a bit darker on the left side uh, but we want to smooth that out a bit so we take the main light and we duplicate it we can use it by using Control D or Command D for Macintosh and we get a new main light and we rena rename that to Fill Light instead and now it's really shiny from the right side and that's not what we want so we change it to it. So we change the rotation to 5 in X level and 125 in Y level and we change the color to something bluish and we change the intensity to 0 0.5. Now it looks a bit better. The ship is darker on the left side but it's not so dark that we miss out any details in the model. So it looks quite good. And we make a copy of a fill light 
by pressing Ctrl D or Command D and we make the final dim light. Rename the object to dim light. And it should shine from our back. So we set minus 15 and 65. It should be a white and it should be even less intense. So set intensity to 0 0.25. So now we have some light shining from behind. We can uh, next to the name field in the different game object, we can disable object temporarily to see how they affect. So we can disable the dim light and you will see that something changes in behind the spaceship. We can look at the fill light and we can disable it and you see that it's the left side is turning more dark. And we want to organize our game objects and the organization container we have is an empty game object. So we create an empty game object, rename the game empty game object lights. The transform is not reset, so we reset it and we drag and drop all the free lights we have to be children of the lights. So now we have our lights container that we can expand and disband that contains our free lights. So next step is to add a background because we are in outer space and outer space is not as boring as a completely black background. And for this we're going to use a 3D object called quad. So Game object, 3D object, and select a quad. Uh, the quad object is added. Rename the quad background. It should contain our background graphics and reset the transform. And if we look at the scene view, uh, we cannot see the quad right now for some reason. Uh, it's very, very small. But what happens if we resize it? Hmm. I will see that something changes. But the quad is in the center of, of the player. We can disable the player to see if we see the quad. Now it's invisible. The quad doesn't have any any background right now. It's uh, it's invisible, so that's why we don't see it. Okay. Anyway, uh, we we don't want any ship or any object to collide with the background. The background should only be there, so we don't need any collider for this object. So we can simply remove the collider. We can either disable it by clicking the uh, disable rear button next to the name, or we can select the cogwheel and remove a component. So we simply remove the mesh collider. And we also want to tilt the object 90 degrees. Oh no, now it looks correct. Now we see it. It's in the same direction as the player object. This is the quad, the blue square that's suddenly turned up. And we want the, uh, the background to have some graphics. The background of our space world. So go to the assets folder and we have some textures. So double click the textures folder. And here we have some, some fancy uh, different types of images and textures. And click the tile nebula green DFF and it will look like this. This will be our background. And to add this, this texture to the background object, we simply click and drag and release it on the background game object. Hmm. Did I make something wrong? Let's see. Now it's reacted. And now you see that the graphics of our background changed a bit. 
So we see the background. And we see if we click the background that a texture object was added to uh, the background game object or texture component more correctly. Tile neighbor green TFF. Um, but it's a bit small and we need to change it. Uh, and it's also in the middle of a ship which we don't want to because it should be on the cover of a game world, the top-down game world and the ship is at the bottom of the game world. So we need to change it a bit. If we look at the image, if we click the image again, we see that the size of the image is 1024 times 2048 pixels. And it's always best looking if we keep the aspect ratio of 1 to 2 pixels when we expand it. So we scale the background, click the background, change the scale on X level to 15 and on Y level to 30. Now we keep the aspect ratio. So the quad is this 2D plane and you will see that it covers the game world correctly. Perfect. Now it looks quite okay. But the background is a bit dark, which we don't want. And it's because all the different models we have uh, when we render the graphics, render the textures, have different shaders. And uh, we're gonna talk a bit about the theory behind shaders in the theoretical lectures. But a shader is calculating how the texture looks like in the 3D game world when it takes into consideration the different lighting and shadows, etc. that happens in the game world. And the shader we have now is not perfect for a background, so we need to change the shader a bit, because it's affected by the lights and we don't have any light that shines down on the texture. All our lights shine from the left side, right side and from the back. So click the shader button here in the background object and we go to the unlit and select texture. And we see that the shader changed or the background changed a bit. Now the dark areas are more dark and the light areas are more light. So now it looks like we want it exactly like the texture looks. So much better. Uh, but if we go to scene view and we click the player object, we'll see that the player object is buried in the background. Some parts of a ship is, is covered by the background. So we need to change either the player or the background, but we change the background now. So we change it to 10 units down. Now you see that it dropped down in the scene view, but the game view looks the same except that the ship is not buried because we uh, changed the uh, we have a top-down view so it doesn't matter the depth level of the background texture so looks correct next step is to actually make the play move so we can play the game so we need some functionality to do that and if we want to add some input to the game we need some scripts and if we look at the assets folder we see that we don't have any scripts folder and that's what we want because we want to organize everything correct so we click create folder and name the folder scripts scripts so now we have the scripts folder. We want to make a new script and the script should be attached to the player object. So we click the player object up here. Uh, now we have a lot of things going on for the player, but we can uh, dis we can expand or disband some of them to so get more space. We click add component, click new script, and we want as always to name the script player controller and make sure that C-sharp is selected, click create and add. 
it shows down in it shows up in the assets folder, so we move it to the scripts folder. So we have everything in the script. Open the scripts folder, double click the script, and the editor you use for writing the scripts is opened. And since I am on Mac, it will open in Mono Develop, but on PC it could open in Visual Studio instead. It depends on what you have installed. So we need to move something. And we're going to speed up this a bit. Uh, we already discussed how to move the ball in the previous uh, practical lecture. So we do something similar here. Here we have a public float called speed when it shall contain the speed. And we don't want the constructor, we will remove that. And since movement is part of physics, we use the fixed update method. And the fixed update, uh, the first thing we need to do is have some input from the player. Get access horizontal, make sure you spell it correctly. I think I spelled it correctly. Load move vertical input dot get axis vertical and we want a movement vector and it's vector free since we are in three dimensional space and equals a new vector that's what we want to move and in x level x axis we want to move horizontal y axis zero because we don't want to move up and down and we want to move in two dimensions and move vertical in set axis. And to move some object around, we need to make changes to the rigid body of the player object. So we need to get the component called rigid, rigid body. And we need to change something. We can either apply a force, which we did last time, but in this change, Time, we will not use any forces, we will instead just change the velocity of the object. And velocity is equals to the movement vector times the speed. Good. Switch back to Unity, select the player, and we see that the script shows up. Player controller script here. And the speed variable needs to have some value, so set it to 10. That seems to be quite good. And we can click the play button up here, and we can move the ship around. Back and forth. But the problem is now that we can move outside the game area, and that's not what we want. We want the play to player ship to stay inside the game area. So we need to go back to the script and we need to detect if the player ship is outside the bounds or if it's outside the bounds we want to disable the move. We don't want it to be able to move outside the bounds. So we can check the position of the player ship and to check the position we need to to use a rigid body again. So we need to make a rigid body dot position. And position is, we change the position to a new vector three. And here we shall add the boundaries for the game world. And if it's outside the boundary, we simply make the max or the minimum to be within the boundary. And we can use a function called math f dot clamp clamp clamps a number between a minimum and a maximum value and what we need to clamp is get component rigid body dot position dot x and it should be within a boundary boundary dot x minimum and a boundary dot x maximum 
and in Y level always zero because we don't move in up or down and on Z level it's the same mof f dot clamp and we need to clamp we get component rigid body dot position dot set and we want to clamp it between boundary dot set min dot x min set min and boundary dot set max good and we can add clamp the position of the spaceship to be within the boundary of the game world. So we know we, we can add some comment to it. Okay. Next thing we need to do is to have the actual boundary set because it's red now. We haven't set the boundary. So we need to make the boundary class. We don't have that defined yet. So we can make a small class, internal class called boundary. And for all classes, we need to write system.serializable. All classes must begin with this if we define new classes. And we define a public class called boundary. And it should not have any logic, this class. It should just contain a number of floats. X min, X max, Z min, Z max. That's the only thing our boundary class shall contain. Okay, and we also need to define the boundary here. So we have a reference to the boundary, boundary class. Okay, now the red is removed here. Now we have make everything correct. So go back to Unity, select the player ship, and we see that we have a boundary reference in the script and we can expand that and then you see all the values that we need to set. And we set the values to minus six, six, minus four, eight. And if we test the game, the player ship should stop at the edges, both down, up, and it cannot go all the way up. But that's fine, because if we go all the way up, we will definitely collide with the asteroids without us being able, the player being able to react. So, so that's fine. But if we want the player ship to go further, we can change the boundary values. It would also be nice if the player ship tilted a bit when we change. So if we go to the right, the player ship tilts a bit, so it looks like it's turning right and it's turning left. And we can do that as well with the script. So let's go back to the script. And we make a slight rotation of it. And to rotate an object, we need to get a rigid body component. As always, rigid body. And we have already set the velocity and position. This time, we need to change something in rotation. And the rotation equals now we need to define some angle, some way of rotating the object. And we will use something called quaternions, and we will discuss quaternions in uh, the theoretical lectures. Quaternion.euler, because we want to define some angles, some Euler angles of how to tilt, how to rotate the player ship. And we don't want it to be rotated in the x-axis, because uh, that's forward and backward. We don't want to, it to be in the y-axis because that's up and down, but in the z-axis we want to make it some, we want to tilt it a bit. So we need to get the component rigid body again. And we want to tilt it by the speed we are going sideways. So the velocity dot x multiplied by a negative tilt value. 
because if we go to the left, we will tilt to the right, so that's why we need it to be negative. And we also need to define the public float tilt up here. That's the variable holding the tilt value. If we go back to Unity, now it's updated, we'll see that we have a tilt factor here. Set the tilt value to 4, test the game, and you will see that the ship tilts slightly when we move sideways, so it looks like it's turning. And we can also test how it looks like. If we set it to 40, what would happen then? Then it tilts around, so it doesn't look very good. So it's too much. So 4 seems to be a good value, so we leave it at 4. And it looks like it's tilting correctly. And you also see that the engine flares looks correctly when we start the game. So, the next thing to do is to make the ship able to shoot at something. Of course, after all, we have a spaceship and we want to shoot laser bolts, laser shots. Uh, and the whole purpose of the game is to shoot down the different asteroids that's coming towards the ship. Uh, so, we create an empty game object that will hold our so shots. So go to the game object menu, select create empty, we rename it to bolt, we call it laser bolt, but just bolt and reset to transform. This will be the parent object for our shots. And we need some visual effects from the shot, so we select the, uh, the. We need to add some graphics to it. So we create a new game object, 3D object, and chord. So we will use a chord, the same thing as we used for the background. That's a flat plane where we can add some graphics. So select a chord. But this time we will keep the mesh collider because the shot shall be able to collide with other objects. Uh, and we rename the quad to VFX, Visual Effects, reset the transform, and drag it as a child object to Bolt. So the Visual Effects is a child object or a Bolt object. And we rotate the quad 90 degrees, so it looks like it's in the same direction as a player, as we see in the game view. Good! Now we need to add some graphics to it, because now it's just a blue-ish plane. So we go into the Assets folder and the Textures folder, and we have some different graphical textures here. So we will take the FX laser orange, it looks like that. Click and drag that and release it on the VFX object, not the bolt object. And now something should happen. I'm not sure why it doesn't react the first time. Hmm. And now it's reacted. So now you see that something black, the bluish plane changed to black. And uh, we don't see how it looks like right now because the player ship is in the way. So we temporarily disable the player. So we click the player object, click the disable button next to the name, and now we see the bolt object as it is. So it looks fine. But the problem is that we don't want the background, we only want the light, uh, laser light to be visible. And we can do that by changing the shader, because we have a lot of different options to use for shaders for different effects. So if we go to the shader here, we go to particles and select the additive. And additive means that all color values of zero is treated as transparent. So now all non-zero values, the laser shot, 
is using the color of the texture, but the, back, the zero values, the black values are transparent. So that looks good. We can also see in Unity that when we select shaders, we have a mobile version of all shaders. And the mobile version is shaders that are a bit more, require a bit less resources from the CPU, so it can use, be used if you use a mobile game, but they have usually have some things which we cannot handle compared to the standard shaders. But since we are not using any mobile, not making any mobile game right now, we use the standard shaders. And to make the, uh, the bolt able to move around and collide with others, we need to make it into a dynamic collider. And to make it into a dynamic collider, we need to uh, add some widget body. But we have two things. We have a VFX object and we have a bolt object. The VSF object, the only thing we want from a VFX object is to have the, uh, the graphics of the bolt. We don't want it to have a collider, so we remove the collider from this object. And we go to the bolt object. This is where we shall add a collider. But first we add physics and rigid body because we want a rigid body component. Uh, and it should not use gravity since we after all want, don't want the shot to go down in the background. And we need to add a collider, so we need to add a collider component and we'll use one of the primitive colliders in this case. So we'll go into the component, physics, and add, in this case, a capsule collider. And we'll see how a collider looks like in green here. And it's, it's a bit too big. That's not what we want. We, we need to change it to be in the size of the laser bolt, approximately. Uh, so, we reduce the size, radius to 0 0.1, and now we see that it's correct, but it's going in the wrong direction, because it's in the direction of y-axis, which is going up and down in the game world, and we want it to have, want it to be in another direction, so we change the direction to z-axis. Now it looks correct, but it's still a bit too big, so we change it a bit, radius to 0 0.3, and the height to 0 0.5. Hmm. 0 0.03 should be correct, not 0 0.3. Okay. If we zoom in a bit, we'll see that it covers the laser bolt almost perfectly. And we also need the capsule collider to be its trigger so we can handle any events what will happen when the bolt collide with something else. Perfect. Next thing we need to do is to add a script that moves the laser bolt when we shoot it. It should be moved in forward direction. So select the bolt object, not the VFX object. And we add a component, new script, and we call the script mover. Make sure that it's C sharp. Click create and add. Go to the assets folder and you will see the script here mover and move it to the scripts folder, open the scripts folder and double click on the mover script and it should open in the editor. That's a couple of things we need to do. We can, the bolt should move forward in the same speed and not, nothing else should happen. So we'll have the speed of it, which we can say change, so public float speed. And what will happen? Well, we don't need to move it every time. We can set a velocity, a speed of the object when it is created, and then it will move with the same speed all the time. 
We cannot do that for a player object because the player object should stop when the player stop clicking the arrow buttons. But here we can just set the speed once and it should have the same speed all the time. So we need to get the component rigid body. That's every time we need to do something with physics, dot velocity. Because we want to change this velocity, speed and direction of this object. And it should be in the forward direct the same direction as the object, and that's called transform dot forward. That's the forward direction of a game object multiplied by the speed. Now it will move in the forward direction along the z-axis with some speed. We go back to Unity and we need to set the speed to something. Click the Bolt object and we can set the speed to 20 for example. And if we test the game we will see that the Bolt is moving and is disappearing in the distant future. Good. The bolt object should not be visible when we start the game. It should be created when the player fire, uh, click the fire button. And a good way to do that is to have a bolt as a prefab. So click the bolt, hold the left mouse button and drag it and release it in the prefabs folder. Now it's turning into a prefab and we'll see that we have a bolt here. Hmm. Why wasn't it moved to a prefabs folder? Oh, I can move it anyway. Now we have a bolt prefabs and we see that the bolt is blue here, indicating that it's a prefab. Good. But we don't want the bolt to be the bolt to be in the game when we start the game, so we disable the bolt simply by deleting it. We don't want it from a start. We already have a prefab. And if we play the game, we'll see that we have no bolt, but we can click and drag, release the bolt here, and we'll see that a bolt is shot. So it's working correctly. And we can also bring back the player a bit because we want it now. Good. So now the ship should be able to shoot the bolts. So we need to check input from the fire button by the player and spawn a new bolt object from the prefab. So a good place to do that is in the already created player controller script. So we go back to the script editor and the player controller script. So we need to spawn the shot at some position and if we use a position it's a transform. Transform contains position, rotation and scale. So we use a transform. That's where we want to spawn our shot. Shot spawn. And we also need an object that to spawn. A game object. Which object shall be spawn? Yeah, that's our shot. And since we are not dealing with physics, we are simply dealing with uh, something, some other stuff, we can use the update method. Oh, what happened now? Oh, it should be public, should be void update, that's why. Okay, the update method. Make sure that you spell update and fixed update correctly, otherwise we will not be called by the game engine. And to spawn a game object, we can use a method called instantiate. And what is it we want to instantiate? A shot where shot spawn dot position and in which rotation angle shot spawn dot rotation. Now we for every time update is called, we instantiate a new shot. And to, to make this work, we need to go back to Unity to define the actual objects we have. First, we need an object for the shot spawn. So create a game object, 
create an empty object and rename it to shot spawn and reset the transform. So, and the shot spawn should be in the same place as the player ship because we want to make the bolt, if we fire a laser bolt, it should be in front of the ship. So we click and drag the shot spawn to be a sub object, a child object of player. So now it shows up as a sub object of player, our shot spawn. Good. Uh, but the shots will be spawned in the center of a player ship now, uh, which is not really what we want. We want it to be spawned a bit in front of a player. So we can change the set position to 1.25 and you see that the gizmo in the scene view moves so a shot will be spawned a bit in front of the ship. And the code, if we go back to the code, now we fire a new shot every time update is called. And that's not good. We cannot fire endlessly. And there are two things we need to do. We need to check for a fire button, but we will also have a fire rate limitation. Fire rate means that we can only shoot a specific number of bolts per second. So we don't have any uh, infinitely fast weapon. So let's fix that. So we add two more variables. We have a public flow called fire rate, how fast we can fire, and we need a private float variable called next fire, which is telling us when is the next time we can fire the weapon. If we go to the instantiate, we need to wrap it up in an if case, if time.time, .time, that's the current time of the game, is higher than next fire, the time we are allowed to fire our weapon, we need, we can instantiate a new shot, we can spawn a new bolt. But for every time we do that, we need to update the next fire, and the next fire is the current time, time.time, .time plus the fire rate. Simple as that. And we also need a button for firing and in this case we I'm gonna use the input.get key and space so we fire with a space bar so for a bolt to fire we need two conditions that the player hits the space key and that we can have that we are allowed to fire again that the current time is higher than the next fire time. We can also use the input.get button, fire one for left mouse button. So we can use it different ways. So we go back to Unity. We need to set some object refer references in the player controller script. See that some things is missing, shot and the shot spawn and the fire rate. So set the fire rate to 0 0.25, the shot, that is our prefab, so we need to go into assets and prefabs. Click the player again. And click and drag the bolt to the shot field. And the shot spawns will be transform. So we click and drag the shot spawn from the player game object to the shot spawn field. So now we should have a bolt, shot spawn, transform, and 0 0.25. Good. If we test the game now, we should be able to... Hmm. Something is not correct in the script because it's fire endlessly. Let's see where I made some error. Hmm. Input.get key space and time dot delta time is higher than next fire. I, I did something wrong here but I'm not really sure what I did. So I'm gonna remove that. Now it fires endlessly. And we need 
input.getg space and hmm. I'm not really really sure. Now it's reacting. I'm not sure why it didn't react before. Now it looks correctly. Okay, when I press the space button, now it fires and I cannot fire faster than this. One problem we have here, as you see, is that all the bolts we create are spawned and are never removed. They are spawned and we create an endless list of game objects. And after a while we have so many game objects that the game performance will lack and it will start to lag. So we need to remove the shot objects when we are moved outside the bounds of the game world. And there are a couple of different ways we can do this, but in this game we will use an invisible box around the game world and destroy all objects that leave the box. So let's add that box. And a box is in a three-dimensional we use a game object, 3D object, and a cube. The cube will cover our game world. So now we see that a cube was added. But we want the cube to be invisible. It should not be seen. It's just something that we will use to see when something is outside the game world. So first reset the transform and to remove the graphics of a cube, we can remove a mesh renderer component. In that case, the component will be invisible. No graphics will be rendered for a component, exactly as we like it. We also want it, the collider to be its trigger, so we can handle events. And we need to change the size. And it should be position 005. So it should be in the center of the game world. And the size should be 15 in X and 20 in Z. Now it covers the game world. Perfect. Now we just need to add a script so everything in we can rename it boundary instead of cube so we know what it is. We rename it boundary. Okay, boundary. Good. And now we will need a script that destroys everything that leaves the box. So we click and add component, select new script and name the script boundary destroy. Good, click create and add, go to assets folder, we have a script here and move it to scripts folder and open script. Uh, and before we can remove this, in the last practical lecture we used the on trigger enter event that happens when something enters an object. But now we want to know when something leaves, when something is not in collision with the boundary. So we can use a method called on trigger exit instead and collider upper. It detects when something leaves the box. And when it leaves the box, we destroy the other dot game object. Simple as that. The problem is now if we click the play button in Unity, the bolt objects are removed when we leave the game world. We can create and shoot as many as possible and we see that they are gradually destroyed. Perfect! So now the player object is ready so far. Now we need something to shoot at and that should be our obstacles. Uh, hazards that the player needs to avoid or shoot at. So let's add some asteroids. And they will be similar to our bolt prefab. They will spawn in the game world. So first we add a parent object, which will be similar to the bolt object. 
So we create an empty game object and we rename the empty game object to asteroid and reset the transform and set the position to 0, 0 and 8. Here it is in the game world. We can put a focus on it and zoom in. That's the asteroid object so far. Change the name to asteroid if you haven't done so. And if we go into assets folder, we have a folder called models. So open the models folder and we see a different graphics model with models. We already used the vehicle player before, but we have something called prop asteroid one which we will use. So click and hold and drag the asteroid one to the asteroid object. And ta-da, you will see an asteroid popping up. Cool. And the asteroid shall move and shall be able to collide. So with our object, so we need to add a rigid body component to make it into a dynamic collider. We don't want to use gravity for it because we are in space and we need some collider for it and the model for the uh, asteroid is quite complex. We want a more simple collision volume. So we go into add a component physics and a capsule collider. So we'll use a capsule collider for this as well. It doesn't cover the asteroid perfectly, but it covers it good enough. So it's a bit small, so we need to change it a bit. Change the radius to 0 0.5 and the height to 1.5 in Z axis. Mm, that doesn't really look correct. It should be in y-axis actually. Now it looks more correct. And we need it to be is trigger. Good. To make the game world or game a bit more alive, we want the asteroids to rotate when we move around in space. So we want them to rotate in some random direction. And we can do that with a script. So we add a component to the asteroid object here. Uh, let's see, that's why I did wrong here. I added it to, uh, I added the component to the prop asteroid model. So let's go back. I remove the two components, click asteroid here. Now it should be correct. Add a physics with your body. Sorry about this, add component. Physics, capsule collider, 0 0.5, 1.5 in Z axis and it's trigger. Now it is correct. Perfect. And on the asteroid object, add the component as well. New script, rename it random rotator, rotator. create an add. Move it to the scripts folder. Open the script folder, open the script. And what we want to do is to give it some rotation when it starts and then it should be moving in that or rotating in that rotation all its lifetime. So to rotate, we need to get the rigid body component since it's a dynamic moving object and rotation is set by using method called angular velocity. We set the velocity, a direction and speed with some angle and it should be a random rotation but since we can rotate in three directions x, y and z we want a random, we want not just a single random value, we want to use a random vector free and we can use it by calling random inside unit sphere. Now we get a random vector free that is with within minus one and one. 
and times tumbles some speed we set for rotation public float tumble and we make it a public variable perfect let's go back to unity click asteroid we see that the tumble value shows up set it to 800 click the play button and tada it's rotating and we will see that it rotates slowly and more slowly and slowly and slowly and that's because we have something called angular drag on the rigid body meaning that we have some uh, there's some force that's preventing movement uh, like friction we have friction when it turns around as well so if we set the drag angular drag to zero we will have no friction since we are after all in outer space we don't have any air resistance so now it moves with the same speed all the time and if we click differently we'll see that the rotation changes all the time because we set one random vector free rotation when the object is created so what happens if we shoot the spaceship um, we shoot the asteroid right now we see that nothing is happened we need to handle it in some way um, and we will handle it by adding a contact destroyer a new script to the asteroid object note that the asteroid object already has a random rotator script but a non-game object can have multiple scripts if we would like to so click the add component new script and name it contact destroy create an add got assets move it to scripts hmm. and open the contact destroy and we want to destroy both the bolt and the asteroid on if they collide so we use the on trigger enter and collider power the method that is called when collisions happen between so we need to destroy the collision object which is the bolt destroy hover dot game object so we destroy the bolt and destroy the asteroid itself so we need to destroy ourselves which is the game object good will this work well not exactly because the asteroid will immediately be destroyed because it collides with a boundary object and it will also destroy the boundary object that's not a good way we, we need to check if we have a bolt and if we are colliding with a bolt so or we can do it the other way around if we we disable collisions for the boundary so we click the boundary object we need to assign a tag click the add tag and we create a new tag called boundary in small letters go back to boundary and set the boundary tag now we have a tag set and if we go back to the script If we are colliding with the boundary, we don't want to do anything. Check if we collide with boundary. If our dot tag equals boundary, then we don't do anything. We simply make return. test the game oh we got 
that compiler error. I did something wrong in the script is error.tag um, should be two equal signs. That's the I forgot to save it. So now it should be correct. Let's see what happens if we shoot it. And it's destroyed. Perfect. Uh, it would also be nice if we had some explosions when we're shooting at the asteroid. So let's add some explosions. Uh, explosions when we hit the asteroid and also explosions when the player object is destroyed. And we can make add an explosion by checking the contact destroy script because the contact destroy destroys the asteroid and that's a good way of making an explosion. And for an explosion we need a game object. A game object is the explosion animation that shall be played when the asteroid is destroyed. And to create an explosion we need to instantiate what needs to be instantiated, the explosion and it should be instantiated as the same position as the uh, the asteroid, so transform dot position and at the same rotation as the asteroid. So we instantiate that. it should be explosion. The explosion animation. Good. If we go back to asteroid and we see the script, we need some explosion. And luckily there are some explosions that follow with the bundle, graphics bundle we download. So if we go to the assets folder, prefabs, VFX, explosions, we have some explosions. So the explosion, click the asteroid object again, click and drag the explosion asteroid to the explosion field in the contact destroy script. and it should be explosion asteroid here. And we can test the game, what will happen, and it explodes. The only thing we have is that the explosion game object is not removed. We need a way of removing it. We'll get back to this soon. And it would also be nice if the player, because the player can collide with the asteroid, and we want an explosion for the player as well. Uh, and we can do that in the same script. So, first. so we go back to a script. If our.tag equals player, if we know what we collide with the player, we instantiate a new explosion. And we call it public game object player explosion and if at our dot tag we if the asteroid is colliding with the player we need to instantiate player explosion and we need to instantiate at the player position and the player is called other here because that's what's colliding with the asteroid our dot transform dot position and our dot transform dot rotation and for this to work we need to assign the player tag to the player so click the player object and it's on tag now but player is one of the default tags that are always added in unity so we don't even need to add a tag we can just simply place the player tag and we need to go to the asteroid and we need to drag the explosion player to the player explosion field. So we have that reference set. And if we test the game, the player is exploding. And it's two explosions, one for the asteroid and a big explosion for the player. But the problem is we still have the 
objects are not explosion game objects are not removed so we need to fix that and a good way of doing that is to remove the explosion object after some time because we know that the explosion animation will be played and when it's finished playing we can simply remove it and we can instantiate returns a game object we can call it tmp temp game object temp equals instantiate but we also need to define the type as game object so game object temp equals instantiate blah 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 as game object and we destroy the game object temp after one second. We do the same with the player explosion. We already defined temp so we can reuse it. Temp equals instantiate as game object and destroy temp after one second. If we test the game and we collide with the asteroid we will see that the explosions are removed after a second. Perfect. That's what we want to do. The asteroid is not moving and we want it to move towards the player because otherwise the game would be very easy. Uh, so we can go back to the asteroid and we want to move it. And we already have a script for moving the boat so we can reuse that script for moving the asteroid. So we can click add component on the asteroid. We can select scripts, not new script because that creates a new script, but scripts goes to all our scripts we have right now. And we select the mover script and select to set to speed minus 10 because he wants to go in the opposite direction as the bolt. And since we want asteroids to be spawned in the game, we, turn, we want to turn them into prefab. So we go into the assets folder, click and drag the asteroid and release it in the prefabs folder. So in the prefabs we will now have both asteroid and bolt. And we don't want an asteroid to be present when we start the game, so we delete the instance. And now we, we need some logic for how to handle things that shall be handled in the game or things that shall happen in the game. For example, that asteroids shall spawn at random positions. And we will use something called a game controller. And the game controller is some logic that is run during the game that handles things in the game. For example, spawn asteroids, keep track of and display score, end the game when the ship is destroyed and restart the game. And to make a game controller script, we need something to attach it to. So we can create an empty object and we call that object game controller. And we reset the transform. So the object will have nothing to do except that it shall contain some script. And we assign the tag game controller. It's one of the predefined tabs. And we shall add a script, new script, call the script game controller, create an add, move the script to the scripts folder. Hmm. It's reacting a bit slowly today. And open the game controller in the editor. What do we want to do? We want to do a couple of things. We want to spawn asteroids, so we will have a game object that we want to spawn. Asteroid. And we want the asteroid to spawn at some position. So we will have a vector freeze into our 3D space. Spawn values. That's the values where we want to spawn the different asteroids and we want to spawn waves of asteroids so we will make a method called spawn waves 
that we will implement. And the spawn waves is responsible for spawning a wave of asteroids. So, where do we want it to be spawned? Yes, we want it to be spawned at vector free. Spawn an asteroid at new vector free. And where where do we want it to be spawned? We want it to be spawned at some random position, random dot range, because we want a random between some minimum and maximum values. So we'll use a spawn values dot x and spawn minus spawn values dot x to spawn values dot x. So a random value between minus x and plus x. It will be spawned at spawn values dot y and spawn values dot z. So it will only be spawned in randomly spawned in the x axis, not the other axis. And when it's spawned, we need to instantiate, instantiate the method we use to spawn an object. And we want to instantiate the asteroid. And we want to instantiate it at spawn at. And we want it to have no rotation in the beginning. And to set no rotation, we can use quaternion dot identity. Now we create it at the spawner position with no rotation because rotation is handled in the random rotator script. And now only one wave will respawn when we start the game uh, because we use a constructor start it will cause spawn waves and in spawn waves only one asteroid will be spawned. But we, need, we want to constantly spawning asteroid in this game because that's what a space shooter looks like. So we add some variable called asteroid count, which defines how many asteroids that will be spawned for each wave. And we wrap the instantiated code up in a for loop for count to start to null. Zero less than asteroid count i plus plus. And we break it up. Now several asteroids are spawned, but we only spawned once, so we need to change that. And we need some wait time before the asteroids actually start to wait, otherwise uh, they will spawn directly when the player starts the game, it will be very difficult. And we also need a wait time between the different waves, so we don't or or the different two spawned asteroids, so we don't spawn 10 at the same position place at the same time, because then 10 will suddenly show up at the top of the game screen and then falling down and it will not look as good. And to make this work we need to have a separate thread, a multi-thread, threaded system, a thread that starts when the game is starting and is running and spawning asteroid. And a new thread is started with something called start co-routine in Unity and it should be wrapped in parentheses and for a co-routine it must always return something called I enumerator spawn waves and after we instantiate we need to wait until a new one new asteroid shall be spawned and to do that to, to wait a number of or wait some time we use something called yield return new wait for 
seconds and spawn wait and the first time we spawn start something we need to yield return new wait for seconds and the start wait the start time we waited the first time we call the spawn waves method then we wait some time and for the asteroid to spawn endlessly we need to wrap it in an endless loop so we have while true and we will spawn new asteroids cool if we go back to unity click the game controller script we'll see that a couple of things show up here we need to define the spawn values and there will be six in x that's the random values between minus six and six zero in y and 16 in z that's the top of the game screen asteroid count is set to 10 spawn weight 0 0.5 and start weight to one and we need to define the asteroid so we go to the assets prefabs folder click the game controller again locate our asteroid drag and drop it on the asteroid field and we can click and we'll see that asteroids are endlessly spawned so now it actually starts to look like something and now I got destroyed too bad it would also be nice if we would have some sound effects on our game so we'll add that as well some audio some background music and some visual or some uh, sound effects when uh, the explosions are played it will be a bit more fun game and in unity we have three major components when you work with audio audio clip is an audio file music or sound effect audio source is the object that plays an audio clip and the audio listener uh, it's a source we position, for example, if we want uh, a sound coming from a specific position in the game world. And there's also some filters and effects that we can use, but we will not go into any of those in this course. So if we go into assets and the audio folder, we will have some different files here. We can play them. I hope you hear that something is played here. And we have some explosions. Oh. So we will use sound effects for all explosions and also when the ship fire a laser bolt. That's the sound effects. Let's see how we can do that. It's quite easy to do that. We can simply drag one of the audio files to an object. But it's difficult here because we cannot see the different objects that we wanted to move to uh, we need to change the layout of, of this uh, of a file panel so we change it to one column layout and it will look like this so now we can open the audio folder at the same time as we open the prefab folder we couldn't do that in a two column layout so change it to one column layout by clicking the uh, the drop down menu to the right in the panel. So, explosion enemy or another explosion, that's what we want to do. So, we start by taking the explosion asteroid and we can drag it to the x to let's see the VFX explosions. So drag the explosion asteroid to the explosion asteroid prefab. And if we click the explosion asteroid prefab, we see that an audio source is added. And we need to configure it. Make sure that play on awake is set, because that means that it's played once when the object is instantiated. And if we want it to play over and over again, we can select a loop, but we don't want to change something like that. So if we click the play button 
and when you shoot an asteroid, a sound effect is played. Perfect. We can set some other things, which will have a sound effect when the player is destroyed and when the laser bolt is fired. So we take the explosion player sound effect and drag it to the explosion player prefab. Now we'll have an audio source there as well. Play on awake is activated. Perfect. Our play is destroyed. Perfect. We also need the bolt. So we can take the uh, weapon player and drag it to the bolt object. That's when we fire something. Let's see if we can fire something. <laughs> To do that sounded good. Let's see the bolt prefab. Hmm. Ah, did wrong. It was attached to the to the asteroid prefab. That's what was wrong. Remove a component V. No. Let's see. Explosion asteroid. Weapon player should be attached to the bolt prefab, not the asteroid prefab. Let's see if it works correctly now. Yes, I released it on action. Accidentally released it on the asteroid prefab, not the bolt prefab. Perfect. We will also use a music background. So take the music background, click and drag, and release it on the game controller. So the game controller will start the background music. And we want the background music to loop. So we click the loop. So it plays endlessly. And we want the volume of the background music to be slightly less than the sound effect, so we set the volume to 0 0.5. And the weapon sounds should not be as high as well, so we click the bolt prefab, change the volume of the weapon player to 0 0.5. So the explosions are louder. We have some background music. Now it's starting to, to look like a game. So what's left to do? We need to calculate and display your score. And when the player is killed, nothing more can be done in the game. So we show some, we show some game over sign and we start the game. So same thing as we did in the previous practical lecture, we need to create score text object. So we create the game object, create empty, rename it score text, reset the transform, attach component, rendering, and GUI text. The GUI text should be on position 0, 1, 0, and should be score 10. Or score zero. I mean, from the start, we change some pixel offset so it's not in the top left corner. We move it in and down a bit. Perfect. Now we need to calculate some score. So every time an asteroid is destroyed, we shall award 10 points to a player. So we move back to the game controller script. We want to have a game controller script calculating the score. So let's edit the script. First we need a reference to the GUI, GUI text object to update the score in the screen and we need some public variable that holds the score which is zero from the start. And we also want some way of updating the score 
So we add a public method called add score in points, the number of points we should be awarded, and score should be increased by the points we are awarding for the score, and we should update the score text dot text to be score colon and the current score. So now we are updating the score, the public method. But we need some way of calling this method because the game controller doesn't know when an asteroid is destroyed. So someone else must call the add score method when an asteroid is destroyed. So it should be called from some other script. And the script that knows when an asteroid is destroyed is called the contact destroy script. So from the contact destroy, we need some way of calling the game controller script. And that's a bit tricky, but we'll walk through it. We need a reference to the game controller, because that's the game controller script, and we call it controller. And in the start void start method, we need to find a reference to the game controller script. And it looks like this game object temp equals game, game object dot find game object with a tag and the tag called game controller. So we we'll look for the object with a tag game controller. And the controller shall be the script in the game object temp named game controller. So game controller equals temp the game object dot get component, which we use to get the uh, rigid body, but now we want to get the component called game controller. So now we have a reference I forgot an equal should be equal there. Now we have a reference to the game controller script. We can also add as in the slides some error message if we would like, but we we'll skip that for now. And if we destroy something that is an asteroid, then we will be awarded some score. But we will not be awarded a score if the tag is player. So if our dot tag is not equal to player, then we know that we collide with an asteroid and we call the controller script dot add score and we award 10 points for that score. And the game controller make sure that we have a tag set game controller. Yes, that is correct. We have a score text reference should be here. Score is zero from the start. Perfect, test the game. And we see that the score is increased if we shoot down the asteroids. Seems to work fine. We also need a game over sign when the game is finished. So that's the last thing we're gonna do when the ship is destroyed. So we make an end text. We can take the score text object, we can duplicate it and rename it to end text. The end text should be in the center of the screen. It looks something like 0 0.44 in X and 0 0.5 in Y. And we make some text, game over, press R button to restart. Uh, we can make it a bit more in the middle to 0 0.4 next level, but looks a bit better. And we can make the font style to bold, so it looks a bit bigger, and the font size to 20 maybe. Well, oh, we need to change that. Okay, so game over, press R to restart. 
And we need to know when the game is ended because that's when we need to show the sign. So we go back to the script and the script called the game controller. The game controller is in charge of everything here. And we need to add a public GUI text and text the text that shall be shown when the game is ended. And we also need a boolean bool in. It's called bool in C sharp when the game is ended. That's the references we need to keep track of. And when we start the game, we need to say that the game ended is false because we start the game, it's not ended yet. And the end text game object shall be disabled because it shall only be shown, sh shown when the game has ended. So we use set active to false to temporarily disable it. Nice. And we need to add the update method because the update method shall see if the game is ended and if the game is ended, we shall reload the game. So if game ended, we have died, we need to check if a player is input.get key down, if a player is pressing the key code.r key, then we need to restart the game level. Because that's what we wrote in the message if we go back to Unity. Game over, press R to restart. So if a game has ended, and if the R key is pressed, then we need to restart the current scene. And to restart the current scene, it's called scene. Hmm. Da, 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 da. Scene. Uh, uh, buh, 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 buh. I think this has slightly changed a bit in Unity. Let's see. Restart. We can look at the. Hmm. We can see in the Unity how we used to restart the level. We can see if we find something because it's changed between the different. Uh, and now we change some code from it. Because it doesn't seem like the code I have in the game controller script is in the uh, slides are actually working in this. Uh, I don't know what changed it a bit. Scene manager. Here is the scene manager. Uh, we need to import the unity.scene management. That's the error using unity engine dot scene management that's the error okay scene level equals scene manager dot get active scene the current scene we are playing and we want to restart the scene load scene level dot name so reload the current level. Get the current active scene and reload that scene. And to make this work is that you need to import the unity engine.scene management. And of course we want to let's see. We need some way of telling the game controller when the game has ended. So we add a new public method called public void end game and when end game happens game ended the game ended boolean game ended is set to true and 
the end text, GUI text, shall be shown. So we set it to active and true. Now we need some way of telling the game controller when the game has ended. Uh, so we can go back to the contact destroy script and if we destroy the player, here we have if our dot tag equals player, we destroy the player and we already have a reference to the controller so we can call the end game method. If we go back to the game controller we need to set the end text reference so click and drag the end text and set it to the end text field. Test the game. So let's see what's up. Now I'm gonna die. I die. Press R to restart. I restarted for some reason. The light shows a bit weird when I restart the game. I'm not sure why it happens in Unity. It might not happen on your computer. It happens on mine. But it doesn't happen when I build a game, which we're gonna do now because Space Shooter is finished. So let's build the game by going to the file menu and build settings and we already edited the build settings before when we started the game so we just click build and we want to build it in the release folder and we call it space shooter click save and now we have a lot of scripts and different resources and stuff, so it will take some time to build. So just wait until it's finished. Still working, building assets. We have quite a lot of assets in here. Uh, you might have a faster computer than I have, so it might be not take as long time for you. Okay, now it's finished. If we open the, uh, we will see in the release folder that's open here that we have a space shooter binary. So if we click the space shooter binary, it will start directly in the 600 times 900 size and it will start. And if I restart it, you will see that the light shown correctly after restart the build, but not in Unity for some reason. So that's all for uh, this second practical lecture. Uh, this is the course uh, 1DV437, Introduction to Game Programming. And my name is Johan Hagelbeck. I hope you have had a fun time making the Space Shooter project. Thanks.